Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Max Min number five in 2024. Our first speaker today is veteran crystallographer Marjorie Seneschal, who will talk about geometry and crystallography. Over to you, Marjorie, please. Okay, thank you, Vizel. Uh, oops. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll first start here with the with the abstract, slightly adjusted from what I put on the uh, website before. Uh, throughout the century from Fedorov's 1885 enumeration uh, of, of the five convex parallelohedra to Schekman's 1982 discovery of the periodic crystals, mathematical crystallography comprised lattices and point, uh, point sets and symmetry groups, tilings, and other topics in discrete geometry. Today, the term also includes models with once forbidden symmetries or whose cells overlap or have soft corners or skeletal rather than solid and continuous metrics to compare the millions of known structures and materials databases. In this talk, I imagine conversations between mathematical crystallographers of 18, 1924 and 2024. Um, so this is in four parts. First, the wheel versus the hat. All these will be explained when we get there. Mapping the crystal kingdom, some questions for Fedorov and continuous crystallography question mark. <clears throat> The wheel versus the hat. The wheel is on the left. Uh, the hat is here on the right. But what I'm talking about is actually uh, this shape on the left and this shape on the right, which is known as the hat. And these are very similar in some ways. Um, you can see the 1924 one. This is the wheel. Uh, it's inscribed in, in the hexagon, in a hexagonal tiling of, of the plane. And this one is the hat that's also inscribed in a hexagonal tiling of the plane. Uh, this one has uh, three of these double, these sections of the, of the hexagon. This one has four of them, but otherwise, you know, there's, there's certain similarities, yet there's all the world of difference between them. This one on the left, the wheel, what I'm calling the wheel was uh, suggested by George Polya, a famous mathematician uh, in um, 1920, when did he do that? Uh, somewhere around there. And uh, this one is very, very recent, uh, a product of discovered by David Smith, who is a retired uh, printmaker, uh, not a mathematician. And then the work was done together with uh, John Myers and uh, Craig Kaplan and Chaim Goodman Strauss. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, Polya's paper was 1924, yeah, uh, was on the, the 17 plain symmetry groups. And uh, he titled it, it's an analogy to the crystal, uh, for the an analogy in the plane for the crystallographic groups. Crystallographic groups had already been found, 230 of them for three dimensions, but the th the plane groups had been left to sit. And Fedorov had done a little bit with them, but Polya finally enumerated them all. And there were 17 groups, as you know, and the, he illustrated them. And this is, uh, this is what I'm calling the wheel, this one here. But the others all, you know, each one represents a symmetry here, represents the, the symmetry groups. And each one of these tilings is framed uh, by one of the five two-dimensional lattices. And so the this one here, the C3, is a hexagonal lattice like this. Um, and this was highly praised paper because it put the finishing touches on a project of bringing crystallography into group theory and abstract mathematics. Um, and also, it's not as well known that uh, Polya influenced Escher. Um, so here's something from Escher's own notebooks of showing how he took one of the Polya pictures, drawings, and began to turn them into to birds. And then, so this is really a, an Escherization of this this one here. I, I just thought you might like to see that. Um, the other, the hat, on the other hand, uh, hit the New York Times big time about a year ago. Uh, it's quite amazing that Times doesn't usually give this much space to mathematics. And here you have it uh, with the hexagons there. And these are all the same, except some are mirror images of each other, which some people thought was wrong, but nevertheless, there they are. And these are all hats, the white, blue, and the two shades of blue. The whole plane is covered with it, but this is non-periodic. And what uh, Smith and the others were able to prove is that it can this, this shape cannot tile periodically. There are some shapes that can tile both periodically and non-periodically, but not this one, that's only non-periodically. And so it was quite a sensation. And that was called the Einstein mean a single tingle tile. Um, and this is the elusive Einstein solved a long standing math problem by Chauvin Roberts. Uh, 
Uh, there was it was such a sensation that Oxford University hosted a hat fest that a few weeks later uh, in in July last year, and everybody uh, who wanted to could get down on the floor and actually try to build out the tiling with that. Uh, and this is part of this is what part of what it was accomplished there. People on the floor building the tiling, the largest patch ever made. Um, and this is as you can see, there's no no translational symmetry here at all. It's just it, but it's repeat. It's going on, but it's not it's not translation. Um, and Roger Penrose came, which was great. Uh, he, had, as you know, was the discoverer of the two tiles that have tile only non-periodically, but whether there would be one was, was still the open question. He came to this. He was very happy to be there. And you, if you notice, this was held at the Andrew Wiles building, which is courtyard is paved with his tiles. These are Penrose tiles uh, out here. So it was great to see Roger again. Uh, and then one last little note, the this question of whether you should have allow mirror images uh, got settled when uh, uh, Yoshiaki Araki showed how you could have a single tile that doesn't, the tiles are just the same way that the hat does, but does not have involved mirror images. And he called it the specter. And this is great. And this is what everyone had expected, the sort of thing people had expected an aperiodic tile to look like anyway, like a freaky kind of thing, instead of just a simple hat. But anyway, here it is. And here's the tiling. And since then, in the last year, the work on this has gone out off the charts. It's a huge subject now with lots and lots more known, but we won't say much more about it. Uh, <clears throat> the second part is talking about mapping the crystal kingdom. Because this has been a problem and an interesting um, challenge since people first noticed there were minerals and that there were beautiful crystals. Early classification schemes for crystals included their virtues and healing powers and surface markings. Uh, which are things that we don't particularly take as important today in studying mineralogy. The fact that crystals grow in some cases with visible veins suggested kinship between crystals and plants. And Linnaeus tried to extend his classification scheme for plants to the mineral kingdom. That included finding mother rocks and father rocks. Um, and this is a book, uh, 1672, uh, by <clears throat> Robert Boyle on the origin and virtues of gems. And it's a very interesting talk about paper or book uh, essay about the uh, about exactly that. By virtues, he meant mainly healing powers, but uh, it's still it's an early, early serious crystallographic work. Uh, but today we're taught to envision crystal structure as how he suggested. I'm sorry, I can't get the umlauts on here. Uh, in 1801, and here is that crystals should be thought of as bricks, little bricks that are stacked up then to make. Uh, make the form, the outer shapes. And these are stacked in the lattice, lattice configuration uh, by translation. And so this, uh, this resolved the problem that had worried people is how could it be that crystals of the same material have different shapes? And he was able to show that if you assume that this is the way that they're built, then you can finish the sacks off in various different ways. And these are different, some of the different ways that he was able to do it. One thing he noticed there is something that people had observed is that none of the crystals that people had found had five-fold symmetry. And he was able to show you can't if you have a lattice structure, that that's impossible. Lattices are incompatible with five-fold symmetry or any symmetry of order greater than eight. And so that became known as the crystallographic restriction on symmetry. And so this is one of Aoi's drawings. This is a pentagonal dodecahedron, but these are not, it's not a regular one because otherwise you would have five-fold symmetry and you can't. So he shows that these are these edges of the pentagon are uh, are not all equal. And then we come to Fedorov, who made fundamental contributions to mineralogy and crystallography. And he enumerated the five convex parallelohedra in 1885 and the 233 3D space groups in 1891. And that was then, it was, <coughs> that was what Poli was looking back on and trying to do the analogy or did the analogy for the plane. Um, in 1905, Fedorov became the St. Petersburg Mining Institute's first elected rector. He's one of the really uh, great figures in both mineralogy and crystallography. And this is one of the nice pictures of him that's available. Uh, and his concept of crystal structure carried on, took, started with, or was based on Aoi's, but it also went further than that. And so he said, you take the outer form, and then you see, if you look inside, if you could see the molecules, you'd see the molecules arranged in a, in a periodic pattern. And... Uh, then you can partition the crystal into parallelohedra, what he called them, these into shapes that stack par in parallel formation. Um, and they, in turn, 
can be subdivided, each one into uh, little compartments for the molecules. So you have all the, mo the molecule, each molecule gets its own compartment, which he called stereohedra, these, uh, and then those fill up the parallelohedron and the parallelohedron fills out the crystal. And if you erase then the pictures that I've drawn of the molecules, you see this structure, this is how he imagined crystal structure. So you have the parallelohedron, which are then subdivided into stereohedron. <clears throat> and he defined, and this is critical to everything that I'm going to talk about, uh, a parallelohedron to be a convex parallelohedron, it had to be convex for him, um, in three dimensions that fills space by translation. And he noted that if you have a convex parallelohedron uh, that uh, fills space by translation, that is, uh, it's centrosymmetric. This is, you can prove this. And, and its two dimensional faces are centrosymmetric too. And he called the, such a polyhedron a zonohedron uh, because its faces lie in circuits of parallel edges. And he called them these, these circuits zones, but we call them belts, or I do. Uh, so for example, the hexagonal prism, which I've tried to draw here, has three belts of length four. So you, you start at any edge of the hexagon and then just follow across uh, and then follow around and oops, 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 oops. previous. Uh, and back when that's, that's length four. And if you started with a different edge, you go loop around length four. This one, you go loop around length four. And so this, I've shown one of these in green. And this other one, uh, the other one, you go this way around the hexagonal faces, around, around the hexagon again. Uh, and um, that's length six. So that's the, that's the hexagonal prism, just to show you how it works. And there is a theorem. This is a profound theorem here. Fedorov got somewhere with it. Uh, and Minkowski, Delaunay, Alexander Coxer, McMullins, and many others have contributed other parts to it. So now it's valid in all dimensions, but I'm just going to state it in three. Uh, a convex polyhedron P in, uh, in three dimensions is a parallelohedron if and only if it's a zonohedron and all its belts have length four or six. So length is again the number of, of faces in the or edges in the in the in the, in the loop. Uh, so here, for example, are two that two two well-known polyhedra which are uh, convex and centrosymmetric, but they're not parallelohedron. So why not? What's wrong with this one? Well, I'll tell you, I won't make you answer, but but what's wrong with this one is that the faces are pen, regular pentagons. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, these are not centrosymmetric. And what's wrong with this one? These faces are all rhombuses. They're all identical. Uh, this is a zonohedron, but it's uh, the trouble is that it's belts. If you start tracing around from here to here, here, there, you get 20. There are 20 faces or edges in each belt and not four or six. So that's why neither of these works. Uh, and he proved that there are only five that do work, five topologically uh, shapes. I mean, you can stretch them and shrink them and so on, but the parallel pipette, which we're labeling P, the hexagonal prism, which we looked at just now, truncated octahedron, rhombic dodecahedron, and the elongated rhombic dodecahedron. And this one you can get from this one from this one by taking a sequence of vertices and sort of stretching them out so that this, right, from here to here to here, stretching out, and you get these faces instead of those faces. But anyway, he discovered this and was very proud of it. These others had been known before. Uh, and then in 1912, Max von Lauer discovered that crystals diffract X-rays. And two years later, the Bragg showed that halite salt has no molecules. Um, and this is a quote from Bragg saying, uh, first, this first established the important point, there is no grouping of atoms into molecules. Each sodium atom is equally related to all six surrounding chlorine atoms and vice versa. So that means that there were no stereohedra that necessarily. There could be in some cases, but that wasn't a necessary part. Uh, Fedorov lived to see this and he acknowledged it gracefully. And uh, although it, it, his whole life work was then put into question. Uh, Stereohedra dropped to a footnote, but morphology, the focus on the shapes of crystals remained much longer than I would have, I thought they would have. This is a pick, this is a book that I discovered when I first started teaching at Smith. It was in the library, uh, uh, nine volumes of Atlas of Crystal Forms and uh, compiled by Victor Mordecai Goldschmidt, who was a German mineralogist and art collector. He called this the Atlas of Crystal Forms. And I poured over this, it was just fascinating. Here's what they look like, page after page after page after page. 
Uh, and this is only 68 of the 364 dra drawings of diamond crystals. But now imagine nine huge volumes of all crystals, all of them done like this. Even though the Braggs had deduced the structure of diamond by x-rays in 1913, nevertheless, he published this in 1916 very proudly and was studied carefully. And he noticed that they're all, they differ in the, the facets are, they're all, the interfacial angles are all the same, but the number of facets and the size of the facets differ. And each one is labeled with indices that were studied very, very carefully at the time. And uh, this was how you learned about crystallography was to study the absolute details, the incredible details of the outer shapes and try to make that some sense of how he's picked ideas from that and Fedorov's. Uh, I found in 1952, there's a, I found a book written in 1952 by Peter Terpstra in Holland, 1001 Questions on Crystallographic Problems. This is 1952. They're all about drawing crystals or labeling the faces. So if this if this face has this label and this one has that label, what is the label of this one? And so forth and all the different kinds of indices. And it's, it's amazing, a thousand and one different questions. And they're not easy to do uh, unless you're steeped in this kind of thing. And as he explains in the book, the reason for putting it out there is that crystal, he was a teacher there at the University of Groningen, crystal drawing intended for accurate representation of geometrical relations in three dimensions is a valuable art for the crystallographer. The st student who wishes to learn the art of crystal drawing is advised to work carefully through at least some of the simpler of the exercises. So I tried to do that. I found them hard, even though he called them simple. But this is interesting. I don't know if any young crystallographer today spends any time learning how to draw. Uh, but that was the thing that you had to do at that time. Uh, and then we come to, to what I consider a sort of watershed. The 1981 International Union of Crystallography Congress in Ottawa, Canada. And its logo, by the way, notice this was its logo with painted red and white. Uh, and this is one of Polya's drawings. It's what they used as the logo for this. And I found to me that this, this conference marked the dusk of one era and the dawn of another. And the, the dusk era uh, is the era of all these different classifications and all the different ways of, of organizing the symmetries and the faces and so on. I actually saw two crystallographers, one was German, one was Russian, uh, having a fight, not over politics, but over this question, are there six crystal si systems or are there seven? And they were yelling and screaming at each other. I won't tell you who they were, uh, but <laughs> I could. <have> been. <coughs> uh, anyway, yelling and screaming at each other. And I really thought they were gonna start hitting each other. They were so angry, but then somehow it got cooled off before they came to real blows, but it was, really was like this, over this question. Uh, and it was only a matter of definition. It wasn't a matter of counting. It was a matter of how you define a crystal system. And they had different definitions and they were just ready to murder each other over that. Uh, and then at that very same conference, uh, Alan Mackay showed an optical transform of Penrose tiling. And then he, he noticed that that's tenfold, which is impossible according to the crystallographic restriction. But there it was, nice bright spots and tenfold symmetry, and what on earth could that mean? Uh, because everybody knew that the Penrose tiling was not periodic. Uh, so that must mean that some sense of order was, that was periodicity was not everything we need to understand about order in, in nature or in order in, in, in materials. So this was the dawn of a new era. And the next year, very next year, Dan Sheckman discovered alloys with tenfold symmetry. And then uh, it took 25 years to, for the first aperiodic crystal structure to be solved. But when it was, it was quite interesting because it wasn't a tiling, uh, it wasn't a polyhedra, a parallelohedra, but packing of overlapping nested icosahedral clusters. This is from Nature Materials 2007, the drawing of the structure. It's quite elaborate, to put it mildly. Uh, and then, as you know, Dan Sheckman won the Nobel Prize in 2011 chemistry. Uh, and the prize, the, the foundation stated, the discovery has fundamentally altered how chemists conceive of, alter, of solid matter. So we're in another world at this point. Uh, and I would say that not only discovery has fundamentally changed how we conceive of solid matter, but also the internet and the artificial intelligence, which is sort of where we're at. Uh, so what we have now is, on the one hand, 1924, the Atlas of Crystal Forms by Goldschmidt. And on the other hand, today, uh, we have <laughs> the, the uh, Cambridge uh, Structural Database and many other databases. That's the way to think about the mapping of the world of crystals as a thing from these all the different shapes that we can come up with here.
Uh, <clears throat> so we have that leaves us with some questions for Fedorov. This is a picture of Father Frost, my cat, who is very interested in, in models. And his main interest is in taking them apart, but he also sometimes spends time contemplating them. And this is when looking at two overlapping rhombic triacontahedra. And the overlap there is a rhombus, uh, rhombohedron here. Um, so do parallelohedra, these are questions for Fedorov. Do parallelohedra really need to be convex? Of course not. Uh, must they be central symmetric? No. Do they have to be solids? No, these are our questions, not his questions. Uh, our answers here. Uh, can they overlap? Why not? Can their edges be curved? Sure. So that's sort of the difference between uh, thinking of the that of the two times, and I think they're really, really tremendously, tremendously new era here. Uh, this is a paper of 2010 by Branko Grunbaum, the mathematician, uh, uh, about parallelohedra and stereohedra and all kinds of hedra, as he calls them, other hedra. Uh, and he says in this, we wish to claim that central symmetry is a red herring as far as parallelohedra are concerned. And this is a red herring. It has nothing to do with, with crystallography, but I just thought you might like to see a red herring. Uh, but he says the reason that the requirement of central symmetry may see, pre, appear to be natural is that studies of parallelohedra have practically without exception been restricted to convex ones. And so he's really questioning why convexity, you don't need that either. And it's true that if you if you define a parallelohedron to be convex, then uh, it also will be centrosymmetric, uh, convex and, and, and parallelohedron. Then, yeah, it will be, you can prove that it is therefore centrosymmetric and so are its faces. But if you don't require convexity, this doesn't, have, doesn't follow necessarily at all. Uh, and he conjectured that, however, that convex, non-convex parallelohedra uh, are similar in a certain sense to Fedorov's five, that he'd really found something there. But, but in the following sense, that if the boundary of the polyhedron can be partitioned into pairs of non-overlapping patches, which he calls S1, T1, S2, T2, and so forth, SR, DR, each patch a union of contiguous faces such that the members of each pair are translate. So there you get translation. Uh, of each other. And the complex of patches is topologically equivalent as a cell complex to one of Fedorov's five, then P is a parallel hedron. Um, and conversely, if no such partition is possible, then P is not a parallel hedron. As far as I know, this has never been proved, uh, still hasn't been. It's, it seems so obvious that it's hard to understand for me almost what needs to be proved here, but it does need to be proved and it, it hasn't been, I don't think. Uh, but if anybody knows of a proof, please tell me. But I, uh, I think it's, it's something you might want to take up. It's really an interesting thing. So for example, how does it work? The wheel satisfies his conditions because we have the boundary. So I'm, we, I've marked these in colors with a blue and then a translate of that here. Uh, we have a green translate of that there. Um, and then we have red and the translate of that. And as a cell complex, you have six edges. It's hexagonal and that's one of the two dimensional uh, parallelohedra, parallelogons. And this does, in fact, tile the planes. We know that was Polya's C3. So it satisfies the conditions, and here we are. Uh, the hat, on the other hand, doesn't satisfy those conditions because it has 13 faces. And if he, his conditions require that we have an even number of faces. And so here we have red, that it's got a parallel red. The orange, there's a parallel to it. The purple, uh, these purples, yeah are parallel, these darker purples are parallel, so forth. But this edge uh, is longer than any of the others, and it doesn't have a, a, par a parallel partner here, which means that it can't tile the plane periodically. This is not a parallel heater. It doesn't mean it can't tile the plane. It just means it can't do so parallel in parallel and by translation. So this is the amazing thing about this. This, this can't tile the plane in parallel formation, but it can tile it. That was the discovery of David Smith. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and here's a three-dimensional example of a non-parallel, non-convex parallelohedron. Uh, indented, here's this rhombic uh, tricontahedron, which as we saw is not a not a parallelohedron. But if we indent its faces, or in vertices, indent its vertices, so that this sort of flipping the rhombic rhombohedron here, uh, so that's a internal instead of external, uh, then it is a non-convex parallelohedron. So to see the, how that works, Start with our rhombic triacontahedron, 
and make a skeletal version of it. It's easier to see what's going on that way. So put it in, in <clears throat> this way, uh, same thing. And now uh, inscribe a cube in there. There are many ways to do that. And here's one of them. And now that when you have this cube inscribed, you have four polar pairs of vertices. You have this one, and then on the opposite over there, wherever it is here, and then I can't do it very, show you very well, but you know what I mean, this one to there. Um, and so there are four pairs of vertices and mark one of each pair white, one pair of each pair green, uh, and the, like which I've done here. And then, oh, uh, wait a minute, we want to go back because I didn't show you previous. There should be another, another uh, remark here, but it didn't seem to show up. So anyway, if you can see, I've indented the whites. Uh, so instead of having this sticking out being convex, it's pushed in. And so these become hexagons that are indented uh, rather than a union of three romb rhombuses uh, that is not indented. So but there's still a union of three rhombuses, but it's now in indented. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and this is what it looks like. We then group them into patches, according to Grunbaum's uh, suggestion. Then we we find that the rhombic tricontahedron is topologically equivalent to a truncated octahedron. And that does fill space. And here's a, my attempt to show how to do it using rhombo blocks. Um, and it's a little bit hard to, because of the color is a little confusing, but you, you can see some are indented. Some of these are indented, some are not. And they fit together just like a rhombic tricon, like a, uh, uh, truncated octahedron and fill space. And if I had more of these, I would have more up here too. So this goes on. But on the other hand, this is not convex, not central symmetric, this thing. Uh, and it, all its belts have length 10. That hasn't changed it anything by, by the indentation. So you get some very interesting shapes that are non-convex parallelohedron. Um, and lots of things that are going on. So <clears throat> just uh, this is just one example of a... Uh, workshop we had at the American Institute of Mathematics on soft packings, nested clusters, and condensed matter. Uh, that was several years ago. Uh, and there are many, many more such conferences happening everywhere and all kinds of interesting things are being discovered. Here is a paper uh, called Soft uh, Cells and the Geometry of Seashells by Gabor Domokos and his colleagues in Budapest. Uh, and uh, central problem of geometry, as he says, is the tiling of space with simple structures, as such as blah, blah, blah. Uh, however, many tilings in nature are characterized by shapes with curved edges, uh, non-flat faces, and few, if any, sharp corners. The important question then is to relate prototypical sharp tilings to softer natural shapes. And that is what they do that. And this will be published tomorrow, September the 10th, uh, in the Proceedings of the Natural Academy of Science Nexus. Um, so look for it because it's an interesting paper. And this is the figure two from that paper. And you see the soft shells and the different kinds of corners that this is, this, there's a similarity here to what we know, but it's different in that respect. And they prove uh, <clears throat> various interesting theorems about this kind of tiling. Uh, so that brings us to the question of continuous crystallography. Um, <clears throat> and here, you, you know much more than I do about this. And I'm just gonna mention a few things. Um, and then uh, you can, this whole rest of this week, we'll learn a lot more. <clears throat> so we face a continuum of new challenges today uh, in bringing continuity into crystallography. The, the picture of the seashell tilings uh, is an example of that, of the continuous reshaping of the edges of the, of the, of the, uh, <clears throat> the cells and the, the vertices. Um, one, I'm just going to mention three things here, Gen generalizing the continuous process called zone reduction um, and surmounting the crisis of what is called fake, if what is generally fake data, constructing continuous classifications for periodic and aperiodic structures. And these I'm just going to mention briefly, but let's look at the continuous process called zone reduction. Um, so this all begins, this part begins back in Athens. Um, this is Raphael's painting, The School of Athens, <laughs> which is now in Vatican City. And this is uh, Plato here. This is Aristotle here. And Plato is carrying a book. Um, and the book is titled, you could read it if you could get up close to it, uh, The Timaeus, uh, which was written about 360 BC. That's a dialogue of one of Plato's dialogues. And it's about the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the four elements. 
all and he says in it all the world is made of four elements earth air fire and water and that's an old old idea uh, but he took it one step further and that one step further is the shapes of the particles of these elements so these elements not only do we have earth air fire and water but they're made up of particles uh and they they, are, they, they have shapes and the particles are the cube uh for earth octahedron for air tetrahedron for fire and icosahedron for water respectively uh which is an interesting thing if if you know uh, anything about the, the uh chemistry of water and the physics of water, icosahedron does really play a role there. And uh, as we will see, the cube plays a role, more of a role in Earth than we thought. So, but meanwhile, Aristotle here says, no, those can't be the shapes of the particles because not all of them fill space because the, his idea was there, there, there are no voids. So that if you have Earth, Earth has to be entirely filled with cubes. It has to be parallelhedron or at least a tile. Octahedron has to be, octahedra have to fill space to create air, tetrahedron, fire, and so forth. He said, so Aristotle said, uh, they don't all fill space, only the cube and the tetrahedron do, not the, not the octahedron tet and uh, icosahedron. Um, and he was wrong about the tetrahedron, and that's a discussion that's still going on today. Um, not that he was wrong, we know he was wrong, but how closely can you pack tetrahedron and so forth? He opened a whole wonderful field here. Uh, but this is what I wanted to show you was a paper by Gabor Domokos again and some other, other colleagues of his, Budapest, Plato's Cube and the Natural Geometry of Fragmentation. Um, and I'll just read this because it may be hard for you to see. Plato envisioned Earth's building blocks as cubes, a shape rarely found in nature. The solar system is littered, however, with distorted polyhedra, shards of rocks and ice produced by ubiquitous fragmentation. We apply the theory of convex mosaics is the theory they've worked out. Um, to show that the average geometry of natural two-dimensional 2D fragments from mud cracks to Earth's tectonic plates has two tractors, platonic quadrangles and Voronoi hexagons. Uh, let's just call, call them quadrangles and hexagons. In three dimensions, the platonic attractor is dominant. Remarkably, the average shape of natural rock, rock fragments is cuboid. Um, and then they give several examples of that, and they prove, of course, all these remarks in the paper. So that's also the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, but this was in 2020. <clears throat> and so, it's, curiously, the Federoff Five uh, parallelhedra, which is related to, are re related by a continuous process known as zone reduction. So remember, the zones are the loops, um, circuits of paces or edges, you know, the, all parallel. Across one, since every face is central symmetric, every uh, edge has a partner edge, and you can loop around that way, and that's a zone. Zone reduction. So the truncated octahedron here has six of these, and they're all they're symmetrically equivalent. You can map from one any one to the any other. They're all like they all loop in one one way, uh, the same way across the hexagon, across a <clears throat> uh, square, across a hexagon, and so forth. Um, these are each lane six, so that's okay. That's one of the possibilities. And now what zone reduction means uh, that you shrink one of these, shrink the, the, all these edges, which are all identical in length, and they are all in the same loop, shrink them to zero. And you shrink them to zero. And when you do that for the truncated octahedron, this reduces to an elongated dodecahedron. My drawing is not very good, but it, I believe me, it's true. And so this, this shrinks to that. Um, then you can take this, and you see it's got some, whoops, you know, well, that's okay. Uh, it has some edges, it has this blue blue edge just around the hexagons. It has the purple uh, loop. It has these, those are equivalent to each other. The hexagonal ones different from each other, so forth. So the, the elongated dodecahedron has two different, two distinctly different sets of zones which you can, one of them reduces to a hexagonal prism uh, and one of them reduces to a rhombic dodecahedron. And both of those, uh, either of those can be reduced in a similar way to a parallelohedron. So we get this nice drawing here, which I can't see because I've got all the faces. I hope you can see it, um, this little diagram. Okay, so that's a diagram. They're all related to each other and by this zone shrinking. Uh, so Plato was right, matter crumbles into cubes. That's basically what it, what this amounts to is saying that if you keep pressuring this and fragmenting it, it'll you'll get cubes. Uh, and this is what it looks like if you look at this in terms of the pack actual packings. Uh, if you were to do those shrinkings 
uh, the edge reductions, zone reductions to the tiling, you would get the, the reduced tiling and you would get uh, end up with the cubes. And there we are. And so the periodic crystal kingdom is, one, in this sense, one continuous family. Now, one thing, I, this is just a little aside, but I think it's interesting. Uh, we can look at Penrose tiling in the plane, just to and talk about this same kind of zone reduction here. In in the Penrose tiling is made of uh, 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 of, um, of parallelograms, and uh, they are central symmetric. And so we follow can make any kind of chain we want to following zone like that, like that. If we choose one of them, let's say this one here, um, then I'm put making those dotted. You see. There. We can reduce the whole Penrose tiling um, by shrinking that all the all the edges parallel to this one, and so in wherever they occur, and there'll be all the be bands of these things, and shrink them, and you end up with something like this for this portion. Now shrink again, and here's another one. Any one of them, I chose this one, and there we have it. Now it's in dotted. Turn those, shrink those to zero, and we get this. And this one's periodic which is curious to me. I think it's interesting. I mean, it's not too surprising because what can you do with just three different directions? But nevertheless, it's interesting that the Penrose tiling seems to have embedded within it uh, a, a periodic tiling there. And another thing to, that is curious here is that Penrose tilings and many, many, many other aperiodic tilings uh, are, can be modeled as projections from high dimensional spaces. And those are usually, in Penrose case and other sections of or projections of, uh, cubic packings of high dimensional space, which that is a higher dimensional parallelhedron, parallelotope. And so there is a shrinkage going on up there. That there's a mirror shrinking going on in the higher dimensional model uh, or from which this is projected, and here too. And pro whether projection and zone reduction may commute. Uh, I don't think this has been studied, but I think it's an interesting thing to, to understand how those relate uh, in the higher dimensional thing from which they're projected as well as in the projection and back and forth again. So I'm just putting that out there. Um, haven't settled this question. Um, but we need a better name for this edge shrinking process. Um, zone reduction isn't a very good idea, good name because these aren't all zones, the, every case that you use it. One of the most interesting things about the aperiodic hat tile uh, is that it, although it's not a zone to as we saw, because it does, it has 13 edges, uh, nevertheless, you can do some interesting shrinking with it and get some interesting things with it. So, for example, here we here I've got this is the 13 shapes and I've colored uh, some edges brown and some edges green, depending on their length. And then this one, which is unique, would be blue, uh, is blue. And if you shrink the brown and the blue, that's this one and the brown together, we're left only with the greens and we get a shape like this. Now, this shape does actually tile periodically. Um, but all the way down, but before you, as you're shrinking, you're still in an aperiodic zone, aperiodic world. So everything, as you shrink these, you're still having aperiodic tiles till you finally get there. However, on the other hand, if you shrink the green to zero, you're left with the browns and the blues and you get this. And this also is a aperiodic, is a period, can be tile, can tile periodically, but nothing until you actually get there. So that's an edge shrinking process, but it's not a zone shrinking because there aren't zones here. So I think this is a, interesting to see uh to to, to explore further um and here is an animation of that by craig kaplan craig is one of the four authors of the original paper of the hat and uh, it's going back and forth between uh, you can see what's happening so somewhere in the middle there it's the hat and then one direction of, is shrinking one set of those edges, the other is it's shrinking the other set. And we can leave this on for half an hour or so, but I think it's you get the picture. And you can look it up yourself. You can download it, which I did from Craig's website, uh, which is uh, here. Um, and so that brings us to the other questions that I've listed, but I won't talk much about or say anything about it, except just to show you some of them. Uh, this is a paper that was published, what, Two, two years ago or something, um, millions of new materials discovered with deep learning. And the AI tool GNOME finds 22.2 million new crystals, including stable materials, over 38,000 or 380,000 that could fill, could power future technologies and so on and goes on 
uh, about this in, in his paper. Uh, however, if you look closely at this paper, as some chemists have done, you find that this is really very great uh, in that the, 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 uh, uh, the, the stable predicted structures there are not that at all. And they don't, they don't, they're not gonna be terribly useful. Uh, a new compound should be novel, credible and util, useful. And this, these most of them are not. Um, so what these are, you know, they're, they're fanciful, but they're not particularly useful and not important advances uh, in crystal structure. And then in, in another paper, this is a paper that Vitaly and Olga and, and I tagged on to this uh, recently uh, about just on these, uh, why it's important to have careful definitions and how to, to use them. Uh, the most important practical motivation to agree on the main equivalences between crystals is the ongoing crisis of fake data in crystallography. You can imagine how easy it is to come up with fake data if you can easily come up with data that just doesn't mean anything anyway. Uh, indeed, scientists could stop the paper mills and publish hundreds of articles and thousands of crystal structures, many of which are under investigation for data integrity. So we have a whole new world, not only a world of, uh, of big data, but a world of which some of this is false. Just imagine if the atlas of crystal forms had fake crystals in there, uh, crystals and shapes that weren't ever really found uh, in nature. But so anyway, it, it just, we are in a new place. Uh, and I just want to close by mentioning one very nice paper, uh, Matthew Bright's thesis last year <clears throat> on continuous spaces of low dimensional lattices, in which he points out that crystal structures are typically classified discreetly by their symmetry groups. That goes back to Polio and Fedorov. However, classification of this nature is too coarse to allow for careful exploration of the space of mapping the landscape of the crystal world. Um, and therefore we want to develop a continuous classification for periodic structures, which he has done for two dimensions. And I think it's, you, you can download it here. Um, and so the debates continue. And here we are at the <laughs> fifth Max Min conference. And I just close with this. So thank you. Thank you very much, Marjorie. Please thank Marjorie for the beautiful talk. Yes, thank so you. let me, let me uh, stop the recording. And...